My name is Jamie. Uh, I'm from the Scala Center, like I said. And I want to talk to you about how you can compose your Scala projects. Um, and I'm going to sort of uh, uh, explain a bit about um, Scala CLI and some uh, changes I've made to it, like hacking on the weekends, etc., uh, so that I could build a full stack app with Scala JS and uh, Scala at the same time uh, on JVM. Uh, so yeah, we're going to explain who we are at the Scala Center, what we do, um, why do we, why did we introduce Scala CLI as the new Scala command? Um, what are some sort of features that are lacking in the Scala command, and why would you want to do what I did and spend, you know, four weeks without any vacation or weekends? <laughs> okay, so Scala Center. Um, uh, yeah, so we're a not-for-profit organization in Lausanne, Switzerland. Uh, it's been uh, founded in 2016, uh, and, well, I will p delegate to my uh, colleague, Anatoly, now. And so on. Um, uh, then we have uh, the, um, part of our resources dedicated to the work on the Scala itself, um, the Scala compilers. Uh, finally, uh, we uh, also do governance. So governance is about balancing interests of different stakeholders of the uh, language. So different parties, uh, such as uh, research, industry, community, they all want different things from the language. And all of those interests need to be taken into account and balanced. Uh, and uh, um, we are also concerned with uh, education and uh, training. Uh, we have the free Coursera courses uh, that uh, teach the new Scala programmers to, to become proficient in the language, uh, as well as we are concerned with maintenance of the uh, docsscalalang.org, which is the documentation of the Scala language. Um, so, yeah, here are some examples of those educational materials. So, functional programming is in Scala is uh, Coursera course. Yes, Jamie? That's the only one. Uh, okay, yeah. Oh, but you, can, um, you can also uh, book with us one on one time if you um, uh, want to learn how to do programming in Scala. And it's called the, the course is called Effective Programming in Scala. And it's on the, what is it? Extension School. The EPFL Extension School. And yes, yeah, so you can uh, pay to have one-on-one -on -one time with us to teach you. Yes. Um, so here is a little diagram that explains in, uh, in one picture what we do. Uh, so here it is all about uh, transmitting the momentum and balancing interests between different stakeholder groups. Uh, so you see several cogs, you see uh, EPFL, which is a university where we originated and it, it represents uh, research. Uh, industry partners, which are uh, all the companies who make money uh, doing Scala. Uh, then we have the community, uh, community people. Those are people who do the open source libraries, and uh, they want uh, all of those stakeholder groups want different things. And this was the main driver for the Scala Center to come into existence in 2016, to be a party that balances all those interests. Uh, here is our team. Uh, we are, uh, as the team composition is varying uh, yeah, at different times, but basically we are around uh, 10 people at uh, any given time, uh, around six engineers, and the rest is administrative personnel. Uh, we are all based in Switzerland, in Lausanne, to, uh, at EPFL, where Scala was originated. So uh, this was the introduction of the Scala Center, and uh, now I'll give uh, the word back to Jamie to showcase one of the projects that uh, he was working on. So thank you, everyone. <clears throat> thank you, Anatoly. Um, if you scan this QR code, you should be uh, directed, hopefully, is it frozen again? No, it's not. Okay. So if you scan that QR code, you should be directed to the lovely five-year impact report that we did. Uh, so you can scroll through here and see every little thing that we kind of worked on over the last five years. And I'm pretty happy and proud of this website because I worked a lot on it. Anyway, um, yeah, scan the QR code if you care, or I can show you later 
the URL. Okay, so uh, hands up if you know what Scala CLI is. It's like 50%. Um, so if you, how many people know that Scala CLI is now the default Scala command? Okay, less, like a quarter. Okay, or an eighth even. Right, so I'm gonna now do a brief overview of Scala CLI because it's the main focus of what I've been working on. Um, it's a tool developed by Virtus Lab to uh, basically uh, be a one-stop shop for everything you need to compile sort of a small uh, sized uh, single project with Scala. Um, so the Scala improvement process, there was the, uh, the number 46 proposal, basically approves that Scala CLI should be the new uh, default way that someone gets started with Scala. Uh, what does it let you do? Basically, you can, is this a very loud fridge or something? Um, yeah, you can run code, you can test code, you can run the REPL, you can um, lo load scripts with it. Uh, it comes with support by default for, uh, the I for an IDE with Visual Studio Code and the Metals um, extension. And the kind of key part of Scala CLI that sets it different from SBT or, or MIL or uh, any of the other sort of uh, bigger build tools is that all of its configuration is just data. So you have uh, this thing called a using directive and I'll give a demonstration later. It's basically just keys and values and it's in your code. So you don't have to think about uh, arbitrary things such as Turing complete configuration. Uh, yeah, the main goal is to be instantly productive at writing typical Scala code. So uh, yeah, you can use a library just by declaring it in the code and you can mix and match Scala native or Scala JS uh, with basically just one line of configuration. Uh, so I mean, uh, I guess a lot of you haven't really seen everything you can do with it. So I'll give a small demo. Um, hmm. That's running. I have to quit that one and restart. Okay, so the main idea of what I'm uh, have here when I make this bigger and probably make that bigger. Uh, hmm. Okay. Yeah, so the, bas the basic thing with this is just obviously, uh, I, I opened a, something called a script files because I just have the, um, that was chat GPT doing that. Okay, so yeah, you can just run Hello World really easily inside your text editor, but also by declaring this configuration at the top with um, using toolkit latest, then now suddenly I'm able to, for example, um, use STTTP. So I think I could do quick request. Uh, yeah, sure, thanks. What does that do? Yeah, so I just did a web request in like 10 seconds. Pretty cool. Um, if you haven't seen this, you can also basically just declare any library dependency at the top, um, like using lib and then uh, Well, maybe that's a real library, I don't know. <laughs> uh, Okay, it is. Oh, wow, I, now I get to demonstrate another cool feature of Scala CLI, which is you can do um, actionable, di actionable diagnostics. So this is out of date, so I just click this, and you didn't see what happened, but it, it changed the version, and then when I save and refresh, then it's cool. Um, 
This isn't the only thing that you can do with this, though, because uh, basically you can have, you don't, it doesn't just do scripts. Um, you get many more files. But uh, so, yeah, like, I, I recommend that you do this as basically the basic way to start with Scala. And in fact, it, it will be pretty much very soon because when we go to, oh, I can't see this. So currently with Scala, the way you uh, get started is uh, you, you go on the home page and click the get started or you click the install button and then you just copy and paste this command in your terminal. And then uh, when I do this, then I'm going to get the new Scala command like uh, when that's finished, then all I do is I could type like Scala version and you see I'm um, using yeah, 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 sorry, absolutely, uh, big font. Okay. <laughs> so it, <laughs> and that one, big, no. Uh, homebrew, I don't know what's going on. Oh, I shouldn't have done homebrew, never mind. Okay, so ignore that. Uh, basically, yeah, with the Scala command, you can, uh, let's go to one of my, I'm really vibing right now. What do I even have in here? I have, oh, I want to go to scripts, okay. Hmm, okay. Maybe I'll, I'll save the demo for later. But the, yeah, the idea is that you could uh, run tests, and I wanted to open a project that had tests, so I could just show you that it worked. Uh, oh, whatever. Okay, um, yeah, if you want to learn about more how you use the uh, Scala CLI, then we just added to the Scala website, the Scala Toolkit section. So Scala Toolkit is basically the uh, a collection of libraries that let you get started and do really easy things with Scala, like running your tests, uh, interacting with the operating system, uh, picking a default JSON library, that has never been proposed before, um, and, and connecting to HTTP and running some requests. So basically, the demos didn't really fully explain, uh, but here we go then. Uh, yeah, if I copied and pasted this code into uh, into the text editor, then I can immediately just run that. Um, <clears throat> but okay, so the the thing I really want to talk about now that I've kind of badly shown you Scala CLI is that I want to show you uh, this project I'm calling Scala Compose, but it's not really a real project, so please don't think this is like an official announcement or anything. Um, it's more like I, what I hacked on the weekends with, uh, with Lukas Shronsky from, uh, from Virtus Lab. So uh, yeah, the problem with Scala CLI at the moment is it doesn't really have any support for source generators or resource generators. Uh, so yeah, you can't really load your protobuf schema and then just generate a bunch of boilerplate that people want that. Uh, I haven't supported that, but I still want to do that in the future, or someone can do it. There's been proposals. Uh, and we can also have a, uh, it only supports a single project, so you can't say, uh, have two libraries that depend on each other uh, that you are currently developing. So what I want to do with this Scala Compose thing is basically just say, take two of these Scala CLI projects and smash them together uh, so that you get the class path output of one into the input of the next one. Um, and I'm still keeping the idea of config as data, and so that basically allows you to uh, declare just the way that you join the modules together. And so now I have an actual demo that I have prepared. <laughs> Uh, 
Okay, so um, has anyone heard of Cask by uh, Howie? Okay, one person, two people, three people. Uh, okay, so the idea with what I've done here is that, yeah, I'll, maybe I'll just show it running. Okay. So what I have here is um, a front end that's written in Scala.js and a back end that's running on JVM with, with Cask. Um, cake, why not, yeah. Uh, but the, the, the point is that this was not built with um, SPT or anything like that, so you have to wonder, how did I get the Scala.js to um, uh, front end, like the web page, to be bundled with my uh, Cask application? Because uh, the way that works in the web server is that we have, basically, if you if you go to the uh, index.html, then it has to load uh, has to load this index.html, and this references something called like the main JS from assets, and that doesn't really exist because it was compiled with Scala.js, so we have to bundle that somewhere in here, uh, which is just basically defined here. But the main um, magic that makes it work is I have this uh, configuration file, which I chose Toml as the syntax to use. But yeah, I can say that I have a web server here, and I say it's an application with this main class, but it also, uh, I don't know, it, it needs to depend on repo, which is the repository that saves my notes to the, to the, the file system, uh, so that is persistent. And then uh, the, this cast extension has just allowed me to have, uh, uh, what's it called? WebSockets, I needed WebSockets. So for example, just because I wanted to do something cool, uh, if you have, two of them open at the same time, then you can do an instant update. <laughs> but that, that's done with uh, WebSockets anyway. Um, so the key, the key point that I have here is called like a resource generator. And this is going to say, yeah, bundle the uh, package, the web page, and put it in this main JS stuff. And when it's all built, it's actually in here somewhere. And we see in the managed resources, this is like the main JS, but it's the packaging output of the web page bin. And this is what Scala.js looks like if you've never seen it when it compiles to the to actual JS. Um, but yeah, I guess the, the point is like, how did I make this work? So probably need to explain a bit. Uh, each one of these, um, so each one of these modules that I declare in the TOML file is a single Scala CLI project. Uh, so we have the web server here. As, uh, so if I actually went into, um, it's probably, probably model is better because it's at the very top of the food chain here. So model is just uh, defining my note, uh, the, the data structure that backs one of these notes and some uh, communication with the WebSockets. Uh, but yeah, each one of these itself is just a, a Scala project. So if I went into the, um, if I just went into the model and then did Scala compile or whatever, oh, that's why I needed to do that. Yep, I just overloaded that uh, with my CS setup. Yeah, uh, CS. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is very bad. Uninstall Scala. CS install Scala. Okay, now this is great. So, um, yeah, so now I can actually show you like, so if I did Scala test thing, then it can run some tests. 
and that test was uh, written with MUnit. But the point is that I just um, ran Scala CLI on just this directory. But when I use uh, this Scala Compose tool on this directory, then it actually like brings all of these different Scala CLI projects together. Uh, and I can also use it from the command line, I think. So if I did, if we go back out, then I did Scala Compose Compile. Then this should do nothing. Yep, that's right, it did nothing because I already built it with the IDE, so there's nothing to happen. But if I did uh, git clean and try and build it again, uh, then you can see it's compiling every single one of these uh, modules in the kind of topological order. And it uh, does this thing where like uh, here, when it, um, in order to build the web server, then we have to build the web page and then we package the web page into the, the main JS and then we copy it into the resources directory. Um, so, so that's how it kind of works in principle, but to, to explain what it actually is doing, you need to kind of look at um, Scala CLI's internals. Um, cool. Uh, so has anyone heard of the tool called Bloop? Uh, okay, so people at the back. Uh, so Bloop is basically like a persistent process that runs on the back of your computer and it uh, just waits and listens for um, commands to come through that uh, are basically saying like, compile this code, run this code, compile this code, whatever. The, the reason it's happening in, uh, as a sort of single process is that um, it reuses the exact same uh, class path uh, to, to um, JIT, basically JIT compile, keep a JIT compiled uh, Scala compiler in, in memory. Um, and then the job of Scala CLI is to take your source files and, and any, of the, um, any of the using directives and to remind you this is what using directives look like. Uh, the point of Scala CLI is to take all your source files, take all those directives, and turn them into something called a bloop, fi uh, bloop project file. And the way that looks is, for example, if you go into web server JSON. Yeah, so a, a bloop project is basically uh, just a big, giant JSON file that um, says what's the name of the project, where does it exist, what source files it has, what other upstream dependencies it might have, uh, which are other Bloop projects, and then where to find all those libraries that you um, require. So really, uh, Bloop does nothing except read data and compile. It doesn't know anything about resolving libraries, um, et cetera. So Scala CLI has to do the job of resolving the libraries, writing this Bloop file. Um, then if I go back to oh, my presentation, yeah. Um, yeah, so, so basically uh, Scala CLI runs in the pipeline. First thing it does, it scans all the source files, scans all the using directives, and then it creates something called an input, which basically um, yeah, aggregates all the settings. Then it has to transform that into the Bloop project, and then it writes the Bloop project to disk and then it runs that Bloop project, and that's called a build. Uh, what I have done in my uh, edition is basically um, when you read the TOML file, you create a bunch of things which are called like a, a, a module. I'm in the wrong project. Um, Okay, uh, I'll have to scan it out manually. Um, so we have the module, and then we have Scala Compose, and then we have the old uh, builder, then I have, oh, no, not that one. Uh, 
Yeah, okay, you basically, uh, you parse the, uh, the, the config file into a bunch of modules, which basically just says, where is it on the file system, what platforms it supports, uh, if it's a library or an application, and then the other modules it depends on. Then in, for example, the compile command, or maybe the run command, uh, this one. Um, once we've uh, read that config, then we get the modules. Um, then, what is that thing? I'll do the compile command thing. Oh yeah, that's why I moved it into this thing. Um, yeah, so then you, you um, get the modules and basically you, you uh, just read the, the root field of that module and then say, okay, tell Scala CLI to just make a project with that directory. And then at some point you have to basically uh, figure out the top topological sorting of all those different modules inside of build. I think this is a bit, yeah, yeah, here it is. So in so we take all of those modules and then in parallel, we're going to fetch, um, actually read the files and read those using directives. Um, and then we make a little graph of basically a pair of the name and the platform. Um, and that basically enumerates the, the real projects that exist. So each of those projects is gonna have a, a JVM version and a JS version, for example, for the, for the model. Uh, that has two versions, because I wanted to have, uh, yeah, the model has a JVM version and a JS version. Then what happens is we get to the point where uh, we have to basically figure out um, what are the real dependencies between both of these, uh, between all these projects, because, going back to this one, uh, Basically, we have two ways to get dependencies on a module. We have uh, depends on, which is like read the class path of, of web server repo and read the class path of class extensions and add it to my class path. And then we also have a dependency on this resource generators thing, which says I have a dependency on web page, but I'm not using its class path. I'm actually using its uh, package output. Um, and, and the reason why I record both of these in the dependencies of of this module as a something called pre-build, which is just saying it's the data structure before I build it. Um, yeah, the reason we need to record the, the resource dependency is because we need to say that at the point that we are going to actually build the web server, we need to have already built um, the, the, the web page. Then once we've got all those pre-builds, we're gonna do a topological sorting. And um, I don't know if anyone knows topological sorting. Did you have to do it for an algorithm lecture class? Okay, cool. Uh, maybe we could just do it on here. Um, it, yeah, it's basically just like, if you have a, huge sea of nodes and a bunch of connections, how do you uh, know what should come before the other? Um, why that's important is basically because when you build module B that depends on module A, then the file system better have already have those class files written before you can use it. So it's just saying, uh, how do we know what actually comes before? And it's a bit more complicated than if you have a tree because maybe you have arbitrarily uh, uh, you know, nodes going in multiple different places and even go looping back on themselves. So it's, it's not as simple as just <laughs> sorting by alphabetical order or whatever. Um, yeah, then once you do that, you just run the build exactly as if it was a standard Scala CLI project. It's just there's more than one of them. Um, but in order to prepare the build, we still have to do a little bit of preparation. So. Um, what am I doing here? So, 
Yeah, yeah. So for example, um, we're going to say, uh, how do we actually fetch the class path of the previous thing? Then the, the reason um, I do the topological sorting is because we actually need to um, fetch the class path of a specific platform and project name, which is what we're doing here. So we have to say, um, yeah, when we're reading dependency, we need to know what was the classes, what's the class directory that will eventually be loaded at runtime. Uh, but yeah, that, that's kind of how that works. Anyway, um, I don't know how long I've been running for. Uh, le yeah, let's just say that uh, I, I'm kind of looking for uh, what else we can explore in this space because there's also this other project that exists called Bleep. And Bleep is like what I showed except it uses YAML files. Um, so it's the fight of, yeah, YAML versus Tomal, who, who's going to win? But ser in seriousness, uh, I think if we want to get this project seriously taken, then uh, a couple of things. We need to have probably a way to um, rip up these uh, these using directives and probably aggregate them all inside this module file. Uh, and the other thing is really, I had this resource generators thing, but it's very basic. It's just package this. Uh, what would be nicer would be to have the resource generators as well, and I think that would make it something like everything a typical person needs um, if they're not doing anything complicated. So yeah, that was uh, what I did, and that took me like basically all of uh, May to, to do, like the first half of May. I wanted to talk about it at Scala Days, but I didn't really find a way to weave it into my talk, so. Uh, because I wa what I wanted to show with this was how we could make, maybe use it as a testing bay for different compilation algorithms because theoretically it was less complicated than SBT or something like that. Anyway, so thank you for listening in. Uh, but I have one more thing to say, which is, um, yeah, where is it? Bam, bam, bam. Oh yeah, no, <laughs> okay. So uh, Scala Center, we are, uh, supported mostly through donations, but we also get some money from when people buy our Coursera course. But uh, yeah, we're basically looking for uh, anyone who, you can either do an individual donation, but also we'd like to partner with uh, companies. And if you are partnered with us, then you can join the advisory board. And at the advisory board, basically you get quarterly reports from us on what we're doing. Uh, in, in, and you get to actually be inside a meeting with us, uh, but also you get to um, formally make proposals that we have to uh, listen to and maybe act on. Most of the time, I think 99% of the time, we actually did uh, act on these uh, official recommendations. So uh, it's a really good benefit to you. It's amazing to us because then we can hire more engineers and improve all those pillars that uh, Tolly talked about earlier. So if you really care about productivity of, uh, and improving the IDEs, uh, getting more, making it easier to train developers so it's even easier to hire more Scala engineers, then uh, really please help us. Thank you. Questions? Yes. Um, so to summarize, I think the question is, uh, what are the biggest design, design decisions I had to make uh, in the, the Scala Compose idea? Um, it's a good question. I think uh, basically, uh, for me, I think the hardest point was, <laughs> uh, how do I sort of add this module bit on top of what's already there? Because you can either just like duct tape it together 
by <laughs> if I um, by just doing the minimal possible thing, but then architecturally it looks a bit ugly. Um, that's at the low level of implementation. From a high level, um, I think there, there's definitely a lot of debate about should we put all configuration for the entire thing in one file? Um, because people don't really like to know, well, yeah, people are often concerned that with Scala CLI that putting the config in basically any sort of file whatsoever could make it more complicated to understand because where does the config come from? You have to go and search for it. And it probably makes it harder if you're doing automated tools that try and recognize your project because if there's no clear config file, then where do you go to look for it? Um, in my opinion, I thought it was okay if each module had their own uh, config and then the, the, that TOML file just said how to glue the pieces together. But I think overall, I think more people want to aggregate everything in one file. So that would be the, the biggest design, design decision, I guess, is just where does the config go? I hope that helps. Okay. Ooh. <laughs> so, um, when you ask, so the question is, uh, what design decisions do we have to make about at the Scala Center? Um, do you mean about the organization of the Scala Center itself, or just in general or across our projects? <laughs> what makes us stay awake at night? Um, yeah, I think it's, it's really, I guess you have to be quite passionate um, just because, you know, uh, also what keeps me awake at night is maybe like just knowing that people are giving us money to work on free stuff and that seems like quite a, a, a luxury and a privilege compared to what everyone else is doing. We get to be like our own in in charge of our own destiny and that seems pretty uh, luxurious as well so i really just thank thank everyone for the situation i'm in <laughs> maybe i can uh, elaborate on the decisions that we are making the challenges that we are facing so the entire past year we were working <clears throat> on setting up the community structures that would uh, well um, go to the direction of governance so concretely, we restarted the SIP, which is a Scala improvement process, uh, which uh, existed for Scala 2, and now it is for Scala 3, which uh, directs how exactly the language is going to evolve in the future, how exactly an idea um, becomes from idea to an implemented feature in the compiler so that it doesn't break anything and um, doesn't, um, doesn't break anyone's code. So that's one direction. So the development of the language is uh, one vector. Another vector is uh, the development of the community itself. So we are working uh, on the governance projects, which includes uh, moderations, uh, moderation team, moderation rules, uh, how to how to enforce those rules on the community so that the community is stabilized and uh, can be trusted by big companies who uh, you look at the community as one of the factors to evaluate the stability of the language and the reliability of the language for the future projects so those kind of uh, imposing structures uh, uh, structures that would serve the language in the long term was uh, one of the big challenges and is one of the big challenges that we are currently facing Uh, yeah, I think uh, a big one, of course, is like Scala 2 versus Scala 3 and how much the Scala Center invests uh, in either of them. Uh, because, of course, like uh, companies uh, care a lot about the long term support of Scala 2 uh, and about the migration strategy. And, of course, we want them to uh, keep being happy using uh, Scala and also to help them migrate for all the reasons uh, Holden says about how. Uh, Upgrading your code is good, actually. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so I think, yeah, it's so there's always this balance we have to strike uh, between innovation and maintenance. Um, I think we've 
doing uh, an okay job. Uh, I think Scalafix is pretty good. Uh, <laughs> uh, people ca can can uh, tell us if they, if they have things they want to be improved uh, in, in that particular respect. But uh, there's been a lot of work, for example, all the work on the ID support, uh, like the Scalafix Center has been working on improving the debugger for metals, and maybe this will also impact uh, IntelliJ because we've been talking with IntelliJ. Um, and but yeah, we the debugger is being improved for both Scala 2 and Scala 3, so you can write either Scala 2 or Scala 3 code in your breakpoints and have them evaluated at runtime. It's really nice. Um, and we've also been uh, having, uh, like recently, we had a meetup with um, a lot of the Scala tooling community at EPFL. So we brought the virtual Scala people, the JetBrains people together and um, even Gradle, and we, we tried to like decide what we wanted to do in, in the future and uh, how much to invest in uh, the different areas and how to collaborate more. So that's your challenge is how to get everyone, because Scala is like a big tent kind of things, and we want everyone to uh, collaborate as much as possible. Uh, so I, I mentioned the Scala debugger, uh, support, which we are trying to uh, integrate with uh, IntelliJ. Another project the Scala Center is working on is Tasty Query, where Jamie did a lot of work, which is um, a library for um, basically doing, uh, inspecting the output of the Scala Free Compiler and uh, doing uh, interesting things with that, like uh, checking uh, the kind of code that the compiler wrote and doing um, compatibility checks for new versions of libraries and uh, also any kind of uh, semantic information you would want to, uh, from your code you get from this library and the idea is instead of having this information only in the compiler that other tools can then start using that without having to replicate a lot of work done in the compiler. 